Today we have Dr. Eliza Bell with us and she's going to help us with some of our problems. Now I don't know whether you guys have problems, but believe me, I do. The industry that we're in is so demanding. It's stressful to figure out um, how to stay in compliance and it's even more stressful to keep your residents in compliance. Um, the buzzword for 2021 has been mental health. Everybody's talking about mental health. Um, Simone Bias during the um, during the Olympics, everybody was wondering, well, what's wrong with Simone? Simone is so good, but she was going through a stressful time. Not only the stress in preparing for the Olympics, but the stress that was in the background in her personal life. And we all have personal lives, but as property managers and owners, we not only have our life, we have the lives of our residents in us. Uh, I'm sure many of you are like me when I was managing and your residents think that you are the psychiatrist and they bring all of their problems to you and they lay them on your desk and they expect for you to work them out. Well, a lot of companies now have incorporated with their insurance methods for the employees to talk to someone in the mental health field. So we thought that we would conclude this last Tuesday Tip Live with just expressing how we feel and listening to an expert to tell us some tips that we could do for stress. This last three weeks, y'all, has been, I mean, it has just, it's just been overwhelming for me. And um, I'm sure that with your budgets due the last quarter, you're getting ready to move into 2022 with the pandemic and us having to rewrite all of our policies and things of that nature, that you all have been overwhelmed also. In fact, the emails that I get asking me questions, are, Ms. Vicki, I just, you know, I think I know this, but I'm just so overwhelmed. I just want you to answer it for me. So we thought that we would have Dr. Bell in today. And Ebony, I'll let you introduce Dr. Bell and we will go from there. I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were doing the introduction. So let me make sure that I don't say anything wrong. So I'm gonna- And you, know, and you only have to say probably my name. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> And she can introduce herself. <laughs> so, um, Dr. Eliza Bell, um, she's a, a, a good friend. Uh, she's known as the village psychologist. So, um, she's a respected leader, speaker, and community advocate. And she's got close to 20 years in the field of mental health. She's a licensed psychologist, a certified forensic examiner. And um, she currently serves as a director of psychological and behavioral services for Alabama's Department of Mental Health. So we are uh, very thankful to have her with us today. She's a smart, smart young lady. And um, we're just excited that you joined us. So thank you. Thank you. I'm actually really glad to be here. I think this is the perfect time to um, have sessions like this um, while you spend a lot of your days and your time having to consider um, the lives of others and, and residents and, and your own stuff. I spend my days trying to consider your lives and what, how you're doing and, or how you're not doing. And so these opportunities give me a chance to just spend a little moment to, to love on you, to care about you, know, you and allow you to realize that you matter and that your health um, will impact the health of others around you, your business, your life, your family, your friends. And so um, there can never be too many opportunities to check in about that and just kind of maybe revive and re, um, re-energize some of those ideas about care and, and wellness. So thank you again for, for having me today. Um, you may see on the screen a, 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 a scene of some of waves. Um, and what I wanted to do was just for a second, because I know that we usually see a lot on uh, in our days, um, just to let ourselves hear the waves brush over a little bit and kind of get a little bit centered, calm, and think about other things besides our work emails dinging and our phone buzzing.
I always encourage people to take a few deep breaths. Relish in the quiet. <laughs> And even if you're not a beach person, sometimes just imagining the sun, the solitude, and the silence can be just enough <laughs> for us. All right, so I don't know how you begin your day, but I think about how sometimes my routine, and I've reworked this over the years, but my routine included turning the TV on to the news or you know, loading up my computer and signing on and, and, and being ready for the day. And a lot of times, you know, I realize that the way we begin our day, the way we begin um, our mornings kind of set the tone for how the day is going to go. And so I encourage you to think about these things as we go through this presentation about how are you, you know, what does your day look like? What does your life look like? And how are you encouraging or possibly neglecting some of your own care for the day-to-day, -day, the busy, the bustle of the day-to-day? -day? I realized, and it wasn't until I had children that I realized that that day daily routine may be a little stressful because what I did see was that I had to turn the, the TV several times after hearing multiple stories about um, killings and, and uh, deaths and traffic and robberies and things that were negative and sad and tragedies. And I remember my daughter saying, this is all that the Alabama has. I remember one day my daughter said, this is all Alabama does. Because all they heard was negative things. And I remember I'm starting my day hearing about such tragic events. I said, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't start the day like this. I don't want you to hear it. So why should I do this. And not that I can't keep up, but just wanted to make sure that I'm not beginning my day with um, feelings about very tr uh, stressful and traumatic things. So today, though, our, I think it's imperative that we talk about, you know, what's right in front of us, and that's the holiday season. You know, we're, they are upon us, they're in us, Thanksgiving has happened, and so now we are knee deep into the holiday season, which also means the end of the year. And so as we end the year out, we think about all the things that we've dealt with um, throughout the year, but also how we want to then go into the new year. Well, it's a little different for us now because we have had a really tumultuous last couple of years. And so when there's already a stressful situation that would happen during the holidays, it's combined and compounded with the fact that we have dealt with global issues that have impacted us all in ways we never could have imagined. But even without that, the holiday season is designed to be full of joy, cheer. We think about Christmas trees, decorations, parties, family gatherings, potlucks, gift exchange. However, for many people, and you think about your own lives and those that you in, uh, interact with daily, it is a time for self-evaluation, loneliness, reflection on past failures, financial worry, and anxiety about uncertain futures. And of course, as we realize, we are all in a state of uncertain future when it comes to the pandemic. But holiday season is a time that, because there's an overwhelming amount of that uh, forced joy and cheer, people are forced to also reflect on what they're missing in their lives. And so again, it's a time of loneliness, a time of all these things that happen, and that financial stress that comes from the whole year now compounded to the end, they feel it more in the holiday season. So during our time together today, we're going to discuss a little bit about holiday blues, depression, stress. Are they all the same thing? Are they different? Um, how to recognize mental health challenges in your own lives, but also maybe in your residence. Um, Self-care strategies and tools for processing your own stress, even with the busy nature of the housing industry, plus a pandemic, plus the holiday. Um, also methods for maybe making your workplace environment with your staff and even in your, in your uh, work environment a more healthy, mentally healthy place. And then give you some resources for when you need to refer people or give people numbers and names and things to call and look up when they're needing some assistance for mental health reasons. But also allow you to ask questions and, and have comments to make. I'm very casual. I feel like we're family now that we've, you know, kind of gotten here together. So if you have questions throughout, I don't mind that in the, in the chat. Ebony may be able to let me know that there's a question or a comment. Please stop me. It's no problem. Um, but other than that, we're going to just kind of go through and, and help give you some resources today for, your, for the rest of your year. So how are you doing? So imagine 
um, that this is your one-on-one -on -one and you have decided, I need to take a mental health day and I'm going to talk to somebody. And I wanted somebody to check in with me and see how I'm doing because I don't know. It's been so much going on. I can't really tell you if I'm coming or going some days. Um, and so what I typically do is give you a little checklist to see where you're feeling about some stress and how work is impacting possibly some of those stressors. So as I go through these little questions, just in your mind, check off if that's me, if it's not, and we'll kind of wrap that up after the questions, okay? So um, as I list them off, just kind of make a mental note, yeah or no. So my life and work demands often interfere with each other. That happened for you. It's a struggle to get time off from work when I need to. And that's also, it's a struggle to take time off from work when I need to. Not just get it, but take it when you can. I spend a lot of time responding to personal emails and phone calls when I'm at work and vice versa. I spend a lot of time responding to work emails and phone calls when I'm at home. I sleep less than eight hours a night on a regular basis. I have frequent headaches and or stomach aches. It is important, it is important to respond to my phone and email even when I leave work. I find myself turning to work as a way of pushing through things going on in my personal life. That's one who may burn the midnight oil because they are, you know, maybe have a lot going on at home and they, it helps to kind of check out. I work more than 40 hours a week. It's hard not to be irritable and lose my patience and my temper. I don't have enough time to relax. I frequently have to deal with work emergencies when I'm not there. I'm tired all the time. My family and friends are routinely upset at me for not being available to them. I drink more than three cups or shots of caffeinated drinks per day. I drink more alcohol now than I ever have. I've had to give up most of my hobbies. And for some, they may even be saying, I don't, I have not had hobbies in many years. I mix business with pleasure. And what that means is that when I do have time off, I'm talking about work, I'm dealing with work stuff, I'm dealing with, you know, extended family things that require my caregiving or my responsibility financially or I'm never able to just be, say, what I'm doing, just enjoy that. Those, if you think about those, uh, the questions I just asked you, and I'll go back to the first one. What I usually do with these checklists, you may have said, I, meet, I may have a few of them. I may have mostly all of them. Um, we try to start to divide out because some of these things are going to be a given with maybe the work that you do. You may have to be available. You may, as far as outside of work, you may have to uh, get less than a certain amount of hours of sleep because of a certain end time of work or beginning time of work. There are certain things that are gonna be a part of your day that may or may not be a given when it comes to the work that you do. However, what we do learn is that there are several things that we do, and I'll go back to the first one as well, that everything that we do in our day-to-day -day that we have control over, that we allow the day-to-day -to, -day to take over and control the day for us. And I think what we'll find out today is that we have much more personal control over how we experience our world around us, even with the stressors that may come, than we realize. And that if we do allow ourselves to take back some of the control that we do have over what we can, then we'll find that some of our stress can be alleviated. Um, so we'll think about some of these items and we, we check in about them because I want you to know that if there are things that you're doing that can say be lessened, alleviated, lightened, it may be time to start working on that now. That way, as you go into the new year, you can create routines that produce and also um, encourage a more healthy lifestyle. So there was a survey done about what has been the most difficult part of living through the pandemic. And so for us now, can you imagine it's been two years, 2020 was like, oh, it's 2020. That's been the most um, overwhelming experience, but now we've gone all the way to 2021. 
still in a pandemic, still in a, a issue where there's issues surrounding that that have maybe lightened a little bit, but really not. So two years now, um, and people responded. This was a, a national star, a survey where managing overwhelming work demands, and I put issues with residents being part of your specific work, financial stress, personal grief and loss, stress, worry, anger, or other general mental health concerns that may not be related to those issues above, and then physical health and our COVID issues, and then stress related to precautions. That was listed as the primary um, issues that impacted people throughout the last two, uh, two years. If you look at that list, there are many who will say some, at one point, all of these items were a part of my stress for the year. Um, maybe one, the grief and loss being a bigger issue at one point in the year than financial worries or stress of your own physical health being a worry in the later part of the year. But many have said that all of these issues have impacted them or the life around them people that they love at some point over the last two years. So when we ask about things like that, I ask, how are you hanging in there? Think about it for a second. You know, how am I doing today? Um, I used to do, where I would ask my kids and my husband, I'm like, how are you today? Because each day we start over and we ask, how are you hanging in there? And you stop and listen. Because we're so used to, you know, we are Southern to the core. We believe in, you know, how you doing? I'm good, I'm fine, I'm blessed, I'm highly favored. And all the while you walk away and you could be really falling apart on the inside. But it's better to just keep your head up, keep a smile on your face, give you a good nod. I'm all right, I'm good. Knowing that we're not, because it's easier to say that to, and move on than to really just let it all out. And so what I encourage you to do is even if you're not letting all that out in passing, because you may be walking, you know, passing by somebody and they're like, how are you doing there? And you're, I'm all right. Is to at least ask yourself the question and allow yourself to process that. Because at some point we need to be honest with how we're feeling because that conflict of I'm doing all right, I'm great when I'm not ends up compounding and crashing and burning when we realize that our reality does not match how we present everything. So why are the holidays so stressful? Okay, so this is a reasonable stressful that we realize happened during the holiday season. They're expensive, kids are out of school, uh, we're busy, okay? There are so much more to do during the holiday season. There's too much togetherness for some or not enough togetherness for others, and that can be overwhelming. Uh, we overindulge in eating, we drink, we eat a lot of sweets, we eat a lot of food, and then we regret it because we feel um, overweight, we feel miserable, we feel uh, sluggish, we feel tired, but while we're doing it, it's a great time. So we have all that emotional experience going around. Um, but then also, in a more serious note, people deal with a lot of grief and loss feelings during the holidays because the traditions are one of the main elements of holiday season. And when you think about traditions and the people that were around as a part of those traditions who are no longer here, it can be really difficult to deal with that. For instance, in my own life, our Thanksgiving for my entire life involved us going to Dublin, Georgia, where my parents are from, to be at my grandmother's home house. And everyone came in town from all over, from all over the other states came in town for Thanksgiving. When she passed in 2012, it really changed kind of the mood of that gathering because we came to be with her. She passed at almost 100 years old, maybe a week short of her 100, 100 year old birthday. So we had her for a long time and that was a great opportunity for us to get together and have her cakes and we all made different items and we stayed for four days together and we hung out with our cousins and the aunts and uncles hung out with each other, it's all these things. But when she passed, that tradition didn't feel the same. And we all kind of struggled to still bring that together. And we have, then the pandemic came and those traditions kind of knocked off on that. So it was like, okay, people are used to going over there, you know, a loved one or a spouse or a child or a mother or a father or a friend. And during the holidays, that's highlighted most when the people are no longer around. And then also we want things to be right. We want our vacation to be set. We want some time off. We want gifts and, and decorations and we want everything to be right, our dinner. And, and it can be just stressful. So we are used to knowing that even if we didn't have overwhelming concerns about health and life and money, holidays are just stressful. But how do you deal with that? 
So if you think about it, what are some ways that you express stress? When you're stressed, what does that look like? If I say, I'm, if I go, I'm stressed out, what would that mean to someone who knew me? How would they know I was stressed out? How does your body tell you that you are stressed? How does your mind tell you that you are stressed? I ask these questions because some may not know the answer. We may be so used to just being, I'm, I'm stressed out. I'm, it's, I'm stressed. We don't know really what that means. I want to talk to you about how to define that. Some universal signs of stress can be that your body aches. You have aches and pains. You have cramps. You may cry more easily. You have stomach or digestion issues. You could be really tired. Your appetite can fluctuate. You may drop off in your performance at work in other areas of life. Your sex drive or intimacy issues are affected. You have difficulty with your sleep. You may have a short temper. You may be very impatient. Uh, you may just be where you just kind of freeze up. Like, you know, you got a lot of stuff to do, but you just can't get anything done. That may happen. Um, your behavior changes where you're more moody when you're not used to being that way. You may be more forgetful. You may have a temper and you may be distracted very easily, have very poor concentration. These are things that can be signs of stress when they're not your typical way of functioning. So when you see, say, stomach or digestion issues, if you already have those or you have a chronic stomach digestion issues, that may not be stress for you, but it can be made worse by stress when it's in your life. Or if you are already a more distracted kind of person or poor concentration, that may not be your stress sign because that may be how you function um, regularly. Or if you have conditions where aches and pains are a part of that, they may not be your stress sign. However, knowing that how you typically function, and if these things are happening, that might be how you experience stress. So it's good to know, how does your body uh, signal that stress is happening? How does your mind signal that? You know, so that way you'll know how to address it when it comes up and you don't push it off as, oh, that's just how life is. It's, oh, oh no, I may be stressed out. So what are the holiday blues? Because there's a difference between, and we, so the answer to that, is the holiday blues, stress and depression the same? No, they're not. They're actually very different. And so holiday blues may be things that come around just around that holiday season. Now, November to December to January and the winter or say in the spring, there may be this, you know, around the Easter time and Mother's Day for, you know, before summer, there may be periods where there's holiday blues that seem to kind of come on to you during a time and it feels unusual. It may feel mild where you feel kind of gloomy. You may feel tired, sluggish. You may gain some weight. They, but these symptoms will typically resolve by the change of that season or the start of the new year. They may just kind of go away on their own and they may come along when those things, you know, are just naturally stressful, you know? And then when those things resolve, they go away. That's more of the blues. It's like a, a realistic kind of feeling where I'm feeling a little not myself, but I don't feel this way all the time. And it doesn't really have a precipitating issue where there was a major event. It was more this season kind of just feels off for me. That's more of those holiday blues. And if we get technical, which I didn't want to do too much today, but it's called seasonal affective disorder, where people may feel more of those stressful signs during seasonal periods of their life and seasons of the year. It could be, again, that changing of the season, the summer to summer, to fall to winter, uh, winter to spring. It can be around holidays, but again, it resolves. And it feels pretty mild. Just, I'm just kind of gloomy, sluggish, that kind of thing. However, we think about stress because stress is something that we all will deal with, okay? Stress itself is not designed to be just inherently negative. We all need to have stress in our lives. It's our body's alert to change the environment. So if I am feeling, um, so you think about being in a situation where um, you hear about a fire, you're in a situation where somebody goes, a fire alarm goes off. In my body, my heart starts to race. I start to get a little anxious. My body is saying, get out of there. My mind is saying, get out of where you are, get to a safety place, a safe place. If my body did not alert myself to do that, I may not think something was wrong because I wouldn't change the system that I'm in. So the stress, what I needed to know, okay, hey, here's me saying you might need to survive. So change whatever you're doing so you can survive. We all do that in our lives. 
it's our physical and emotional response to things when we cannot typically cope the way we normally have. And so say um, you're having a baby, you know, or someone that you love is having a baby. It can be a stressful time, you know, because your body is changing, your the lifestyle may be changing, the livelihood is changing. And so naturally you find more supports, you get medical care, you, you know, you get things to prepare yourself for that new life. That's what normally happens when you're dealing with a new or big change in your life. Say you're moving, making a, a large move, selling a home, moving to another state, moving to another area, leaving family. Those are naturally stressful things. And what you do is prepare for that. You get what you need. You, you know, you prepare the moving truck, you get the resources to get where you're going. You may involve friends and family, but when you don't have those things to cope, you then may become where you're stressed out. Okay. You're overstressed because now the ways you normally would pull together those resources to cope with that are no longer enough to meet that demand. And now I'm having a difficult time controlling the feeling of being overwhelmed. So life challenges will stress and affect us very differently, but we know this, we will all struggle at some time in our life. We're all gonna deal with stress at some time and we'll never all do it perfectly. That may be a, uh, an accepting kind of like feeling for us all that, hey, we're all gonna deal with it. We all will experience it at some point in our lives. And so knowing that, how do we then move through that? So coping well with stressors can play a role in maintaining good physical and mental health. But when your stress mounts, then your burnout, your exhaustion, your feelings of being overwhelmed, that's what moves. But how bad can it get, okay? So neglecting one's experience with emotional challenges and stress can lead to physical health issues, like more colds and flus, your system can be compromised, your immune system. Um, irritability, depression, headaches, gastrointestinal disorders, infertility, sexual dysfunction, exhaustion, and heart disease can be made and impacted by our neglecting of our own emotional internal health experiences. It can also, in a more emotional sense, contribute to failed relationships, isolation, withdrawal, divorce, and even estrangement from our family and friends. Because when we don't take care of ourselves, we don't realize that our, what that looks like to the outside world is a, 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 a neglecting of that presence every day. So we may then shrink. We, again, isolate. We withdraw. We don't want to engage. We are difficult to have relationship with. And all the while, we don't know that that's happening. But what's happening is that we're only impacting ourselves in a negative way by not taking care of ourselves. So looking at differently, so we talked about stress, okay? And stress being that natural, again, experience that we all have, things will stress us out. Um, like uh, Ms. Vicki mentioned that this end of the year for you all, you're dealing with certain like budgeting issues and tenant issues and things that are naturally gonna be, you know, stressful. They don't have to be overwhelming, but they're stressful, okay? We, there are things that, you know, I had to get this in by this deadline. That can be a little, you know, you get, you're, you're pumped up for that. You're, you're anxious about that but it won't take you out. You know, it may be, I'm going to get through this period of time and I'm good. Once I get to that book close, I'm good. Or when I get to this point, I'm close, I'm good. That's stress. But when those things become more overwhelming, we may be looking at some more serious mental health issues. And so how do we know what those mental health issues may look like? The more common things you may see um, that result from stress or overwhelming anxiety, um, overwhelming feelings are depression, and anxiety. So today I'm going to talk about what depression and anxiety actually are. That way you will be more clear about how to identify what that looks like or just go, hey, I'll know when I get to this feeling, it may need to be a little bit more serious because we may hear people go, I'm so depressed. I'm so depressed. And they don't really know what they're saying. Or you may hear tenants or residents say, I'm so de I'm depressed or so-and-so is depressed and not know what that looks like. So depression, just at a glance, is that we all may feel sad, moody, low from time to time. Some, um, you know, that may be, a, again, a, a reasonable experience. If we are dealing with grief and loss, you know, dealing with uh, loneliness, those are things that you may feel sad or you may cry. That's, that's actually normal. We, we are human beings. We experience a range of emotions. So you can feel these things and that could be perfectly okay. However, when you feel this way for a, an extended period of time, 
intensely and it does not go away, you may be looking at some more chronic issues with depression. And that may be all the things that we mentioned, but they're for an extended period of time and they don't go away. We typically say two weeks or longer and then a month or longer. And so we start with two weeks because we're like, okay, for the last two weeks, I have had headaches every day, stomach pains every day. I don't wanna go anywhere. I don't wanna do anything that I used to do. My friends can't even get me out the house. My kids are, you know, asking for me to be more upbeat. My husband is saying this. My daughter, my son is like, mom, you're changing. And I don't know what's happening. I can't concentrate. I'm forgetting everything. I'm having a hard time making a decision. I either fall asleep all the time or I cannot sleep. People go, I'm just, I stay up all night long. My mind is racing all night long. Um, I don't eat. My appetite has changed where I just don't want to eat anything. I eat way too much and it's not my normal, again, that holiday, you know, enjoyment. It's that I just I have been eating everything. And I experience feelings of either being guilty. I feel worthless. I feel hopeless. I feel helpless or I'm always negative. Those things, again, alone would be, okay, well, what's going on? Let's figure that out. But when they're happening and they're just not going away, that actually can be a sign of depression. And so some may shrug off, I'm always in pain or I'm always having problems with my head, I'm having headaches, or I'm, of course I'm not interested in things I'm doing because the pandemic, we can't go anywhere, we can't do anything, but no, it's that idea that I don't want to do anything. I can't remember anything, I'm forgetting all these things and it just will not leave. Then we're thinking about more of a depression. Anxiety on the same um, scale, that again, we may all feel anxious, a pending eviction, a giving birth to a child, giving a speech, um, having to make a big decision. Those are things that can make us anxious. That's just natural, you know? Um, but if the feelings of anxiety are lasting, we start at two weeks, then we get up to six months and they're interfering with the person's life, there may be an issue with that, okay? And interfering with your life. So my, my, um, way of kind of signaling mental health issues. I say, you know, y'all heard the phrase live, laugh, and love. We see that on signs. We see it on home, you know, things you can put up in your house or candles. But we look at it as a mental health signal. Is what I'm experiencing now affecting my ability to live, laugh, and love? And so when I mean that, I say laugh. Do things not, I don't find enjoyment anymore. Is that my ability to laugh and have fun? Um, love, are my relationships suffering because of whatever I'm experiencing and live. Can I, am I having health issues? Am I having any ability to keep me from doing the things that I normally do? Am I being, are my ability to live, laugh, and love being affected? And if that's the case, I may need to check in with somebody to figure out what's going on. So anxiety, we look at that six months being a, a, a good indicator, but two weeks is usually the start. Feeling restless, wound up, nervous on, you know, that kind of my nerves are bad. I hope my nerves are bad. My, um, my energy is bad. Being uncomfortable, always in social situations, you avoid people, even with your own family and friends. Having difficulty controlling your feelings of worry. You may worry about everything, you know, just worry, worry, worry. Sleep problems, same as depression, stain, you know, you don't get good sleep, but you also may have heart racing issues. You feel like you're sweaty all the time. You're tense, you have, you think about even in your, your head, you're having this tension in your, in your face and your cheeks, your shoulders are tense all the time. Um, and you're always short tempered. Okay, some people just kind of have a, a little way about them. People get on their nerves, you know. But if you're excessively irritable where you just really cannot, you know, everything seems to bother you and that's not normally how you are, anxiety may be a, they may be a sign of anxiety. And so, we don't take it lightly because at the same time, these are happening to you, in you, and around you. And it can, it can affect your day to day. It can affect your health, your wellness. So don't shrug it off. If you're feeling these things, take note of that. Take note of when you don't feel like you're your normal self. And some may say, well, you know, it's been so long. I don't know what normal is for me anymore. I've been feeling these ways for a long time. And that's the cue. If you've not heard it, then you'll hear it today. Take some time to take care of yourself. Check in about what this may mean because just because it's been happening a long time and you've been functioning does not make it okay. I, you know, it makes it that you, it's okay for you to not be okay and to say, hey, I didn't, I wasn't like this two years ago. I wasn't like this a year ago. And maybe it's, you know, my time to say, 
I want to get back on a better track. I don't want to feel this way every day all the time. I don't want this to be my, my regular life. So when you think about yourself, um, but think about who you're interacting with, when you want to find out if there are these things that we just talked about happening, whether it's the stress stuff, say if it's stress, say if it's depression, anxiety, you know, or the holiday blues. Either way, it, you may then know that somebody around you is going through something or yourself. So whether it means talking to yourself, which I do and I encourage, so I'll even highlight that today, where I may ask myself these questions. But if you're thinking about people, you, your staff, and, or as you look at them, some may are more personal. So maybe somebody who you love or who you're around or who you care about, a church member, a friend, a family member, a close coworker. But some are just for those who you may not know on that level and you want to just be able to check in. So if you say, I've been worried about you, how are you? And wait for the answer. Because usually you can tell. You say, how are you? Someone goes, I'm good, I'm fine. But I can tell in that face that you don't really mean that. So I may stick around to say, but really, you know, how are you doing? And again, assess how close you are to the person because that may not apply to someone who you are not comfortable with having a very intimate discussion with, okay? But also, I've noticed some changes in you lately and I wanted to check in with you, you know? That could be a coworker, a staff person and not, and again, you find ways to make that more of your own language and your own way of speaking, but that may be just a time to say, hey, you've been, are you all right? Want to just check in, you know? Or it sounds like you've been having a really rough time. It must be hard to try to hold everything together when you're feeling this bad or when times are this tough. And as we think about residents who you know there are things going on and it may not be for you to get in their business or to find out or to be their solver, you may be able to just empathize because we, again, we're all going through something, whether it may be significant, whether it may be light, we're all dealing with different things. So being able to say, it must be really hard to try to do all you're doing. You see a mama struggling with you know, her children and there's a lot going on and she's a single parent or a father, a single parent and, or a person who you know, is taking care of their grandmother or a child or you, know, you, you, you just know. If, you know, I wonder, you know, how are you doing? It's a lot, you're doing a whole lot and I know that might be a lot for you. So how is that going? And it must, you know, it must be a lot to manage, but I know, you know I wanna make sure that you're, you're good or I wanna check in with you and tell you good job, you know? Bless you. You know, those things you can just give somebody a kind word, a good word, um, or asking someone that you do know personally, when did you start feeling like this? Something happened that started this? Did something happened or something that you, you know, you're aware of that happened to you? Or I understand, how can I find you help? Or just how can I find you help? Is there something I can do to get you to help? And that's an a interesting um, point, a question. Instead of saying, how can I help you? because you may be opening the door for things you can't not do for that person. And that's okay. It's perfectly fine to not be the solver of all someone's problem. But just being able to say, can I do anything to get you to some help can mean the world to someone who just doesn't know where to go or what to do or how to be supported. Can I get you to some, some, to some support? Even if you're not gonna be that support, because you may not have the strength at that time to be for somebody else, but you can't be to yourself. But being able to say, can I get you somewhere to where you can be supported, again, can be in the world. Or feeling blank, whatever that is. Feeling grief, feeling overwhelmed, feeling tired, feeling stressed, feeling angry, feeling lonely is not a sign of weakness. It takes courage to speak up, and I'm glad that you did. It takes strength to just be able to sit and acknowledge that you're having a difficult time. You know, thank you for doing that. Can I help you get to some help, you know? So I think we start there because stigma, you may have heard the phrase stigma, it's the negative or the, the words we use to describe difficulty that we're experiencing that may keep someone from dealing with them because of fear of ostracizing and embarrassment or shame that may come along with acknowledging feelings. We see that in our African-American communities, our minority communities, our uh, gender specific, whether that's with men or with, with you know, people who are having relationship struggles. They don't want to speak about that because it feels like they're being weak and not being able to deal with that. But to be able to say that and to have someone acknowledge you for saying, I know it's, it's not a sign of weakness. It's not a sign of, you know, um, you being not, it takes you being more strong to do that, to be able to say it and courage. But I wanted to give you some reassurance, okay? 
imbalance and stress are guaranteed to be a part of life, but it can actually benefit you. So to know if you've been functioning for two or three years if, with all those symptoms I just mentioned, you may not know that life should be different than that. But what I want you to know is that when you do know that stress can say, it can be that fire alarm, that signal, that light switch that says, hey, this is the way it's supposed to be. Let's turn around, let's pivot, let's get some help, let's intervene, let's, let's change our direction. It's our alerter. We need to have that stress to alert us to say, let's check in. And I think it's good to be able to acknowledge that stress can be what benefits us in our health to help us attend to ourselves. And also, we can be our answer. And you may feel overwhelmed by feeling like, you know, I don't know what to do. We actually have more control over our lives than we think. And not what happens to us, but how we respond to it, how we address it, how we react. We have all the control of that in the, in the world that we, we don't know that all the time. We think that life happens to us and we just have to take it. And you're right, with the pandemic was the best example of life happening to us in a way that we had no say in a lot of things that came along and still don't and may never, may never return to the way we were before. But to know that we can shape how we experience it, how we talk about it, how we speak about it, how we, how we sit in it, how we let it affect those around us, um, our experience with them, we do have more control about that. And then to know that sometimes all you can do is all you can do. And that is okay. We always think that, you know, we need to be doing more and I should be doing better than this. And I should be doing way different than that. But sometimes just being able to show up can be the, the biggest impactor because we didn't have to do that. But just being able to say, today is the best I got and not feel guilty about that because you've done the best that you can. I think we don't give ourselves enough grace or credit for just being able to do the best that we can and knowing the best we can may just be again waking up that morning and showing up not that we showed up with you know a one and we were at our best and you always saw a smile and i had you know not one fly away and i was dressed to the nines who cares sometimes just being able to be present is all we can do and that is perfectly fine please know that that whole you are enough that's where that that's what that means it's like just be me being alive today, maybe the best I can do. And I'm grateful for that, you know? But when you know that stress may come and stay, holiday blues time where it's gonna be around, you're gonna have it. If you're dealing with grief and loss or health issues or loved ones issues and you know it won't go away. And it's not, so it's not like, okay, well, yeah, stress will be gone tomorrow. No, if it's the reality that it's gonna be here for a while, what do I do? So here's your tips today on this Tuesday. So take note of what remains constant in your life. So while everything about you may be going completely mad, there is something that's, there's something that's constant in your life. Is it a relationship? Is it a pet? Is it a, a, day, a coffee you have every morning? Is it a show you watch every day? Is it a routine that you may be doing that, that might be just your automatic thing, a drive to a certain place every day? Delight in it, and it seems elementary, but delight in those things that have been unchanging that you are used to, you know, everything else being so inconsistent because it's the stuff that's constant that helps us to feel grounded, okay? And also remind yourselves of what you are good at and the things you bring to the table because, again, when things are pushed on you, it's easy to say, oh, well, I'm not doing this and I'm not doing that. Oh, my house not clean and this is not happening and my this going wrong. But there are things that are amazing about you and that comes with having to write them down or have someone tell you you've forgotten have a person that you love and, and 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 trust tell you those things that they know are good about you write them down on note cards and put them around your house so you can remind yourself how good and strong that you are set short-term goals the pandemic taught us that you know we can't plan out sometimes a year ahead. We can't plan vacations and plan time with family and everything we had got canceled. You know, I had plans to go see my siblings who live out of state, couldn't do that. I had plans to take some time off and do some, take a break. Well, the break was not happening because there was so much going on in our, in my field. And so limiting your exposure to social opinion, okay? Not letting the thoughts, the words, the input of others all the time impact how you see the world, okay? Knowing that those things are one thing, but you 
ultimately set the tone for how you feel about what's going on around you. Identify how faith and spirituality show up in your life. It can look differently for everybody. The one thing that did happen for so many is that faith practices were eliminated in some ways. Um, the outward the practice of those things were eliminated for so many because of the inability to be able to meet in groups. And so a lot of people in our mental health world, our clients identified that they waned a little bit in their faith throughout the pandemic because they weren't getting that regular automatic thing that they had been used to with church or um, uh, spiritual practices like yoga and things they were doing to help them feel peace and calm and, and re-energize. They weren't happening and they didn't have anything they were doing in their own home enough to keep that going. So re-energize those things that you can do without having a public meeting, whether it's prayer or writing or meditation or quiet, those things that you can do without anybody around, identify how that can show back up in your life. Book in your day with routines. So that means how do you start and end the day? And that means that no matter how the day goes, I'll begin my day and end my day the same way and not the, automatic, the same routine every day, but I'll start my day with things that are constant, whether that's waking up in the morning, having some quiet time, having my cup of coffee, having a reading time, an exercise routine, whatever that looks like, start and end the day, or my nighttime routine is my shower, or a show that I watch, or a book that I read, or a time with my loved one. I do it every day, and that way I can say, no matter what happened between a nine to nine, eight at eight o'clock a.m. and 10 p.m., I do this. I have the same kind of assurance of life being constant for me. Also, set differences with others aside. If you can identify things that are petty, that are not impacting your life on a day-to-day -day basis, not going to make you make or break you, let it go. We have enough to deal with that is actually real, present, and significant where those things that don't have to matter don't have to matter. So let them go. Let those things out of your life that are, you know, can be easily checked off as non-significant. They are currently taking up too much space in our hearts and heads, and we can be doing other things <laughs> with that time. That's a good tip for your residents too. Like let these things go that don't have to be significant. Plan ahead if you can. I'm horrible about that. So that's why it's helped me plan ahead, make a list, schedule activities in advance that can you can look forward to. And also what I'm doing today for you, hopefully, is sign someone else's permission slip. If you know somebody around you that just needs to hear, hey friend, it's okay for you to be where you are right now. Or if you, I have a girlfriend that always complained about her house being not clean. Always, she always says it. Girl, I can't, I don't wanna have nobody. My house, I don't know, my house not ready for no guests. And I told her, you know what? Instead of that being how you leave, if you're, if you, I know it makes you feel bad. So, but you either gonna clean the house or stop saying it because what it's doing is making you live in a, a period of guilt and shame and frustration. But then it's your day to day life. So either live with an unclean house and move on for, or clean the house. But I remember I had a girlfriend of mine who, who I knew was having a rough time. What we did was put together and had someone go clean her house. Because we knew that she wasn't going to be able to, she had the strength not to do it. She was overwhelmed. She was tired. She had had health issues with her, her mother, who she was a caregiver for in another state. And so she was just stressed out. It wasn't going to change. And so every day her saying it was more of a feeling like, I know I don't want y'all to judge me. But my thing was, we didn't. But if you knew that you had a friend or a family or a coworker that says, hey, you might want to take a day off, a mental health day, a day, a holiday, a PTO, whatever that looks like for you, take a day. You may have to be that person to sign their slip for them because if you didn't do it, they may not do it. And that might be everything to them. And then with your workplace. So as we're, you know, bringing it to the, to the workplace and closing out that we recognize that things may not be the same as they were ever again. I think as we know how the, the life has been for this world over the last two years, we may never go back to how they were. And that's okay too. We can redefine how that will look for us moving forward but we can change the course of how that means. So instead of that whole, I think people laugh about this email that started off, I hope you're doing well in these uncertain times. That was an introducing phrase for a lot of people in their emails with I hope you're doing well in these difficult times. Well, that also kind of phrases the word, the, word, the day as kind of like, oh, in this gloom, I hope you're all right, because we're gloomy, but I hope you're all right. We can change to how we speak about things, how we look at life, 
if we start our day in discussions with gratitude, maybe sharing things that we're happy about, that we're thankful for, even say we take off happy about, thankful for, and that can be life, our limbs, our loved ones, our ability to drive, our ability to see, just things that we take for granted. Um, and so that was that thing about me with the starting the day with the news, that I, my day was tainted by hearing such negativity that I had to just turn the TV off and say, let me start the day with something else. Music that sounds uplifting. Um, uh, a discussion about something that sounds good. So sending messages of hope to staff and residents and to yourself. So if you have a normal you know, reporting that happens and updates that goes out, emails that go out, some things that are negative incidents, things like that that have to go out, manage or balance that with also emails and messages about hopeful things, uh, good news stories, uh, positive quotes, songs, inspirational poems and stories. It's almost like balancing out what's gonna normally be a difficult discussion day with some more positive things to kind of help shape it all a little bit better. So tap into your resources, utilize therapy. I'm an advocate, of course, you're talking to a therapist here, but I'm an advocate for counseling and guidance, support groups, um, um, again, counseling sessions with people when you need that. And I think we all could use it at some point in our lives. So either that's your insurance covered, there are other things, I'm gonna give you some numbers and things to call at the end, but like there's free resources there. I have looked up when I was looking for help for a friend, there are multiple free support groups going on around Birmingham and surrounding counties for almost any issue. Parenting, grief, loss, transition. Um, there's mental health groups that are, and they're free. And people, people grief for losing a spouse. Older uh, individuals who've lost spouses. Younger individuals, they're very specific groups too, they're free. So just things like that that you can utilize and again, no one has to know. The thing about the pandemic was that we also opened up the ability to do virtual therapy, virtual counseling, telephone services that people had not been aware of, that you don't have to leave your house. You can be sitting in your car talking to your counselor and get that energizing support affirmation that you may have needed to make it through the rest of the day. And then be realistic with yourself. Again, the holiday blues, knowing that that's a real thing, holidays are stressful, so don't say, well, it's going to be perfect. I'm not going to have anything go on this year. We're going to have a great season. It's going to be great. Yeah, it's great to be positive, but be realistic. If you know you're dealing with a health condition that you have to manage and that it may get rough at times, be open to that, but then know that when through that, I may say I'm going to have a positive attitude about it or I'm going to be thankful for what I do have. I'm going to make sure I have everything in place to take care of myself, whether it's a hospital on call, a doctor, a family member, like just prepare yourself, be realistic about it and not be caught off. Talk to your staff about things related to wellness. You know, be conscious about the amount of complaining sessions. We talked about that in my work setting, which we work to kind of transform the fact that we, we got used to having that coworker, even if it was myself or somebody else, where you start the day and you stand in their office, which we don't do as much anymore, the office thing, but maybe it's on a Zoom or a meeting, and you go through the list of things you could complain about, whether it's the boss or the supervisor or a budget issue or for a co another coworker, but that was the, that was the fellowshipping, was complaining, you know, and it wasn't like, and we laugh about it, but it was like, that was what we did. We just liked to gripe, <laughs> you know, the whole water cooler thing where you gripe and complain. I mean, that's what we all do. We over here again, and here we go again. And we would walk on off and just be just as fine. But the not knowing how that affects us to be have those words being spoken over our day and our people that we're, uh, people that we're around and the work that we're doing. And I don't mean you have to be walking around jolly jolly and, you know, just pretending but we choose how we communicate and how we function throughout the day. And that's our choice, what we talk about and what we let come in and out of our mouths. So think about things related to wellness. We talk about, you know, send out messages about, you know, uh, self-care and, and exercise and activities that people can do and, and events people can have that can encourage wellness and not just the, um, the complaining. So consider consulting with the wellness person to have ongoing mental health discussions. Like today, keep the discussion going. I mean, so as we're talking about, this is a lot to present today, but think about pulling out just one thing, you know, gratitude, pulling out um, uh, stressful, uh, managing stress, uh, work-life balance, things that you can talk about just as the months go on that can be 
um, integrative of what else you're dealing with that can be overwhelming. So just having that ongoing discussion about things that can, can encourage you to be well, and even with your residents, sending out newsletters that have things about taking care of themselves and wellness and grief management and financial uh, stress management, whatever that looks like, just having ongoing things that can talk about that. And identify what self-care will look like for your industry. And if that means that self-care for this place, this workplace or this type of work will be set days for mental health breaks where we encourage all of our uh, you know, uh, property owners and managers to have a month of a personal, a personal day a month, even though you can take more than that. But like we are saying as a company that we will encourage this day off a month. I know with the state, we get a personal day, I think twice a year. And that's just for them to say, take it. And if you don't, you'll lose it. Like they're like, and they will keep reminding you, take your personal day, even though you can have your own time off and your scheduled vacation. But like, here's our personal day for you. Take it, please. Otherwise, you know, whatever. So how will you encourage self-care? Or will you have quarterly events, quarterly wellness events where there will be times to do an exercise class or a reading, a book club, or uh, an opportunity to have a sharing, um, a gift thing for the holiday, whatever. Are you doing holiday uh, gatherings, virtually or otherwise? Like making sure that you put those things in place, whether it's community events for that, you know, community classes that there are, you know, yoga or, or art or um, craft making or things you can do to encourage residents to have times to fellowship or either just check out of the day to day and do something fun. So resources, we have a few hotlines. Um, I'm a fan of hotlines for a few reasons because they're anonymous, but they also can get you to resources throughout your area that you may not be aware of. Post this Zoom or today, I can um, leave with Ms. Vicki and Ebony um, longer list of like actual therapists or you know insurance providers and things like that where you can have names of some therapists in the Birmingham or Jefferson County area or other county areas. But the hotlines are good because they can get you to things more quickly if you're not aware. And so as you see on the screen, NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness is a national site, but they have so many resources. There's flyers, there's discussions, there's videos on their website, which is nami.org. I didn't have that there, but I'll send it to you. Um, where you can look up and find out about anything. And we talk about depression and anxiety, but I also there's things more significant like schizophrenia and paranoia, bipolar disorder, things that are happening to people that you may not know anything about, but want to know more, where there's someone who may be a little bizarre acting, a resident where they're talking to themselves or looking like they're responding to something in the air that may not be, no one else can see, delusional, they may seem to be either intoxicated or um, under the influence, knowing how to handle that, who to call. Like those are things you can get resources for on these, these numbers listed here. Also a suicide prevention hotline where you can call 24 hours a day when you may feel low. I've had a coworker that I gave this phone number to um, years ago that mentioned that she had this number for her elderly mother who called and she had no idea because her mother was living in a um, assisted living facility and was considering suicide. And I remember her saying she was able to call the number from her room and just talk to somebody. And she had no idea that her mother at 80 plus would have even thought that, but was glad she had a resource and the person, the counselor on the line and encouraged her to speak to her family about what she was going through and she did and they were able to get her help and also didn't know she needed as much support as she did because she was not speaking up about it and that's okay but she was able to talk with a counselor who encouraged her to talk to her family and that could have saved her life so there's a senior talk line a local uh, talk line for seniors where there's counselors there who are uh, um, older counselors who also are available to talk also with the youth line where people who may have children, teens, kids, who there are other high school and college age trained counselors, peer counselors who can talk to them about what they're going through and also get them resources in the Birmingham, Jefferson, Shelby, uh, Blunt County areas. I think it's even Shelby County, Shelby, Blunt, Jefferson, and maybe even Walker County areas um, where they can get assistance. 
So the holidays are known as a time of peace and joy. And so what does that mean to you? Now we talked about holiday stress, blues, all those things, but there is positive to the holiday season. It can be how we reflect on times of peace and joy. So my question to you is what brings you peace and joy? As we end, as we bookend this presentation with the highlight, with a positive, and we kind of filled it with some difficult discussions, but how do we end is thinking about what is peace and joy for us? Identify that. If you think about what those mean to you, identify them, write them down and delight in them this season. Spend more time doing them this season. If you're, you know, your family brings you peace and joy, spend more time with them. If your pets or your activity or travel brings you peace and joy, do it. Like this is your reminder to do those things in this season to be able to delight in that. And so peace and joy, I think about how the video of the, um, the waves were one thing, but I use these videos as like my background um, for like, as I'm working because it helps me be peaceful. So the, the while that may not, the, the beach may be one thing. Here's a scene, coffee scene, rain. As we quiet down, bring back our center for the end of the presentation. Think about, again, what we talked about. Take some more deep breaths. Kind of bring ourselves back. These are all on YouTube. You can look up scenes of just about anything and have them in your background, have them as you listen to them. I'll give you a few seconds. Helps us check out, bring ourselves to a sense of calm again. Again, we can be hearing buzzing, you know, text messages and emails and alarms, or we can choose to hear calming sounds. So they have these videos, they go on, they can go on for hours. Um, and I like them. I, I pick a different one usually in the mornings and just listen to, you know, again, whether it's waves or the rain or fire scene, the holidays, they have some with Christmas trees and, and, and the fire crackling, but it helps me because I know I hear a lot daily and to be able to, to check out and not have to hear that so much, it, it really helps. So questions, uh, answers. I am just grateful that y'all did not mind me talking back all this time because um, <laughs> it could be a lot. Um, but I thank you for sticking in there. But I wanted to give some time to if you had any questions or anything um, as we end. Do we have any questions? I have comments. Um, first of all, let me thank you. A mm -hmm. beautiful presentation. I found myself in so many different areas and parts. In fact, I took notes. I, got, I wrote a lot of notes. Um, I just want to say that um, it's important to have a good life work balance. I'm a person that's guilty of not. I'm a workaholic. And sometimes when you don't slow down to listen to the waves or listen to the music, or um, smell the aroma, the Lord will slow you down or something will slow you down. And I found uh, myself this last month in the hospital with my son for a three week stretch. The only time I've ever missed three weeks from work has been between the two weeks before Christmas and the one week after New Year's. I've never just taken off three weeks and done anything, but that vacation time once a year. However, I was in the hospital and work was on my mind. As the doctors came in, I was answering emails and, you know, just, I, I've got to work. I've got to, and, and the, the emails that I were answering were for the people who are either on this call or who should have been on this call and you just feel obligated because they need you to be there for them. Um, mm -hmm. This presentation has let me know that it's okay sometimes to say no or to put aside work. So that's what I'm gonna tell you guys that are still on. Sometimes it's okay. Sometimes you have a resident, I remember when I was managing 
you have residents with attitudes. Sometimes it's important, like she said, to just to just listen, let them get it off their chest, not go word for word. And when they finish, ask them, now, do you feel better? Because that's the way I used to do, because we really never know how to walk in another person's shoes or what they're going through. And this, I mean, I just have so many notes here. I do want to say another thing. She told us about the NAMI, N-A-M-I. Ebony put it out there on the chat, NAMI.org. Uh, a lot of you are not in the Birmingham or in the Alabama area. We have people from uh, Virginia, Connecticut, yeah, okay. all over the United States. But I'm sure since this is a national organization that you can reach out to the organization and find resources in your area. Absolutely. And I encourage you to do that. When she talked about the schizophrenic, um, we had, and I'm sure a lot of you have who have elderly problems. Sometimes the elderly, either from being alone or some, sometimes they don't have family members to visit, they stuck them in this 202 property and never come back to see them. They have, their, their imagination runs away with them. Their mind runs away with them. We had a lady that was sure she had Martians that were coming in every month in her electrical. If you, um, listen or if you try to do a little research it might help you to help miss williams that's going through these things and sometimes just to to let people know that you care just just takes a different persona of the conversation of their actions and everything so this has truly been a a great presentation for me, and hopefully it has for you also. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? I just wanted to say thank you, because thank a lot you. of times we uh, think about, well, how am I going to deal with this coworker, or how I'm going to deal with this resident? It starts with us, and so I really appreciate the tips and you. Uh, making us check ourselves as to what's going on and really how to try to approach it differently so that that stress doesn't turn into a health issue or, you know, so just thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And mm -hmm. following up on that, just to, that is so true. You brought up um, speaking about the, the elderly um, that's similar to other residents where you may see some behavior that is concerning and what we've, all, we've known for many years is like, you just kind of let people be who they are or don't bother anybody or don't get involved because that's what we're used to. You don't know what's going on in the world. So we don't know who we're interacting with and what problems may be caused. But a lot of times we may be neglecting what could be a bigger issue. And if it was intervened on, again, not us having to be the intervener, but get, getting them to some help could actually change the rest of the way that their living situation is going. So they say they're in a situation where they're bizarre acting or having some behaviors that may be causing damage to the property or concern for safety or issues in the community. If they were just put towards some help, that may have been um, remediated or assisted with as opposed to it getting worse or just going, oh, they're just Miss so-and-so. You know how she is. Or you know that's so-and-so son, how he acts. Well, this is not to make a negative situation at the end of this discussion, but there was a, a event over Thanksgiving in Georgia where a lady's son um, attacked her and she, and she was killed, unfortunately. But the residents in the community all said, yeah, we knew he had uh, mental health issues. He would be outside, you know, talking to himself. And he was even on my camera doing some weird stuff one time. Nobody, you know, again, not have to be his counselor, but no one called anyone or thought to, you know, and again, it's not their fault. Let me just say that it's no one's fault. But what I think about is that we have that happening around us on a much lower level where it's like, oh, so-and-so, Miss so-and-so may be doing some strange things and we just let it go and it could get worse. So instead of in that way, maybe helping to even encourage a more healthy community is to just at least, you know, intervene where we can as far as getting them to some help. Not again, not having to be the one to make all the difference, but to get them to some help. Great. There are two other things 
that I just thought were awesome. And sometimes we have a real quiet audience. Um, today we were going to give a gift to the first person who uh, chimed in, but they, they're, they're real quiet. Now I'll get emails when this is over, but they're real quiet on the, on the Zoom call. Um, you said seek wise counsel. That's great. Uh, regardless of what you're seeking it in, if it's on the mental health side, if it's on your life or uh, legal issues or work or work issues, you need to seek um, wise counsel. The other thing during your presentation, I sent it to Ebony. I said, Ebony, I had, um, uh, what is it? Uh, it's called the blues. I had the holiday blues and didn't even know that I had it. Yes. During Christmas holidays, what have you, I always say, I'm going to have all of my shopping, my gifts and everything out of the way by the 1st of December, right? After the Black Friday sale, I should be through. But all during that month, I'm still picking up. By the end of the month after Christmas, I'm looking at all of these bills and wondering, well, Vicki, you had a budget. How did you go over the budget? What is all of this stuff? Yep. And I don't get um, a lightness in my spirit until about April or May when the sun comes out. You know, I said, well, just let me hibernate like the bears. When the sun yeah. comes out, I'll have a different attitude. So that is really, really true about the, um, the holiday blues. The last thing that I'm going to say is that to everybody that's watching, that signed on, to those of you who usually watch after hours because, you know, it cuts into your day or you're, you're doing something, remember what she said about setting aside days or time for mental health. For me, I can't set aside a whole day. I just know I can't uh, because I haven't gotten to that level yet. But we all should set aside an hour a week that we just do nothing. We look, listen to the waves or we listen to the music or we make our list of things that can improve us or things that we can do to improve someone else. We can start with an hour and bill. But I think it's important to set aside some time for mental health. I'm going to tell you this joke, and y'all can't repeat it, as if this is not going to be published. But um, at a certain age, I went to the hospital. I'm going to say in my 50s, because all y'all know I'm over 50. And the doctor's nurse asked me, she says, um, Miss Bell, you did not list your medications on this paper. I said, I don't take medications. She said, you're such and such age and you don't even take pressure medicine? I said, no, I don't take any medications. She says, well, how did you get by with not taking at least blood pressure medication at 50 plus? I told her, I just told people what was on my mind. I got it off of me and just told people what's on my mind. But I have found that that's not she the does. way to do this. <laughs> Listen to them. I have found that that's not the answer to the problem. The answer to the problem is going to be for me to set aside some time for mental health. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. As I said, uh, Simone was a great inspiration to me when she was going through the Olympics. She admitted that she had issues. She admitted that there were things that were bothering her. And I will never forget the courage of that young lady. A lot of times we feel that courage is weakness or admitting is weakness. But after listening to Dr. Bell today, it's not weakness. It's a sign of inner health, that you're helping yourself. If no one else has anything or any other comments, I'll thank our guests again, Dr. Bell. Um, this has just been phenomenal, just phenomenal. And it has really helped. It was, it was, Miss Vicki. Yes. I just want to say, and, and the speaker, it was very good. When I was um, listening to it, when we, before I even got up there, I was thinking that it was going to be geared towards uh, uh, the residents, like really targeting the residents. I was like, okay, okay. But it, it helped on both sides. So it was very good. I, I enjoy 
um the look the videos even i have looked at some of your videos i'm tasha from new Bern. i look at okay. some of your videos and i just i enjoy um listening to it and um keep keep it up so it's very helpful thank you thank you well, that's great tasha um send ebony put in your chat your email address so that we can get in contact with you Sure. Oh, she has it. Yes. And Dr. Yes. Bell. Yes, Tasha, if you could send me your email address, that would be great. Yes, and Dr. Bell, how can people get in touch with you? I don't know if you are offering virtual counseling or how that works for you, but how can so you get I, I can, I'm, they can contact me at my email address or on the website, which you could put in here. I can or type it in. It's the same, drlizabella.com, where you can fill out the contact form on there. Currently, so in the new year, I'll be taking more virtual clients. I have a pretty full caseload right now, but I, when even now, I'm referring people to my own dear colleagues. So even if you still need assistance, I you can contact me and I can get you to someone. One of my goals um, for this coming year is to build a larger network of what feels like intimate colleagues to where across the nation we can come together and help to connect people to services very quickly. What I think what happens now is that people are calling some of our national sites and um, getting uh, referrals for folks when they have to wait six months and eight months to get in. And what's happened where I found the most res resources is us calling our friends around in different states and saying, hey, can you see somebody? And it usually helps. It's almost like that, oh, I have a guy that does this, or I have a mechanic that does that. It should be the same way for services, for health care, mental health care, which is really where the whole village psychologist comes from. It should feel like a community resource where you can call on that trusted person to get you help for whatever that is, whether it is that, who's your hair person? Who's your nail person? Who's your counselor? You know, because I think that we should have that type of feeling about taking care of ourselves the way we do about all of our other things that we do. Who did you, who makes your cakes and you know, who all this. So the same way. So yeah, still contact me. Um, and I can still get you the resources, even no matter where you are um, in the country, we'll still look to try to get you some, some help or your, or whoever you're also wanting to help to refer to as well. As Tasha had um, reminded us that we do want to serve our residents. We do want to help our residents. We know we can't tell our residents to go see a counselor. Number one, they're going to call the HUD resident complaint list and they're going to say, that manager called me crazy and she told me I needed to go see a psychiatrist. We know we can't do that. But by taking the tips that we were giving them today, that we were given, and reversing them to use with our residents, like being patient, or saying a kind word, or, or, or just having a listening ear. Sometimes, especially with our elderly residents, they just want somebody to listen. Mm -hmm. Now, can we listen all day? No, we can't. But when we see Ms. Johnson in um, going out of the building, you could say things like, Ms. Johnson, I haven't forgot that your granddaughter's having a baby or whatever have, just to let Ms. Johnson know that you listen to her. Sometimes, acknowledging. Mm -hmm. yeah. And acknowledgement means everything. Just know during the holidays, the one resident comment I have to make is, and, and this is also pers a personal life, um, can be going on in your personal life too, but during the holidays, we see an influx of domestic violence um, situations. Um, food neglect and child abuse situations, uh, financial situations where people will suffer and not say anything to where they're losing like the utilities or things like that. And so just knowing that, again, like Ms. Vicki brought up, we're not to necessarily have to intervene and say, I'm going to call you out or refer you to someone, but just being able to know that that is happening it may help to soften our approach to people throughout this season to know that somebody could be going into that apartment or to that home, closing that door and dealing with pure hell. And so to know that when you have an opportunity to cross paths, to send a note, an email, whatever you're normally sending out um, that happens to go out, look at how you're, the words you're using, the tone you're using the prayers you may be having to yourself silently for someone that could be struggling. Those things matter. Um, whether you, you know, again, the way you approach life 
and how people approach, see you experiencing the world that may help save them. And not that you have to be the savior of anyone, but we can't control how we then um, uh, show up in the world. So that's why we can't be the one to necessarily, like you said, you're going to get some recalls or complaints and we're not putting ourselves in danger. But just to know that those things are realistically happening all around the world and they increase in magnitudes during this season. And so there will be a chance that it, all of us and all of you will experience someone dealing with that, no doubt. And just to know that and to know that that may cause you to be more empathetic, more compassionate, more understanding, and just more um, overall uh, aware is a, is a good thing. And those prompts that, that, that she put in the PowerPoint of how to approach people, like how can I get you some help? I think all of us need to take note of those and try to put that into our conversations when we're dealing with people who may be troubled. Yeah. And I know that this, is, this session is being recorded because uh, as Ebony told you, uh, Dr. Bell, people do um, view it later during the night, whatever time. But uh, is it possible that we could get a copy of the PowerPoint to post on our website? Yes, I can send it to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, guys, I know we're over where we usually are, but it was well worth it. I want to say Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you. We will not have a live session for the end of December, but Ebony, the great marketing person that she is, will be sending out greetings to you from Navigate. You all have a blessed day. Dr. Bell, thank you again. And I thank all of you for tuning in. Spread joy and love. That's what I got from today. All right. Thank you. See you later. Bye-bye.